You know what time it is. You know what time it is. You know what time it is. It's real vile time, baby. It's course. It's the G to the E to the R to the M. The T stands for the, but you already knew that. And you're about to rip it up in a modern way. So you know it's got to be Mr. Germ T Ripper. And of course, I got my beautiful co-host, the Prime Minister, the Sinister, Mr. Ruthless Chris. Say what's up to the people at home, Mr. Ruthless Chris. How you guys doing? All those psychopaths out there in real violin. That's right. Psychopaths indeed. Uh, so what's new and exciting in your world, Mr. Chris? Uh, you know, not a lot going on right now. Uh, we're really ramping up for King of the Kill. You know, there's a lot of work going into that and a lot of moving parts, getting all that put out. We were, we're, we're rolling the announcements out and getting all the musical acts and all that lined up. Um, aside from that, I've been kind of just uh, staying home and... Uh, I, I have recently, um, uh, I caught up with the, the kids from 10 years ago and just got addicted to Grand Theft Auto Online as of yesterday. So I've just been doing a lot of that, uh, you know, just watching movies and uh, looking forward to talking to our guest tonight, James L. Edwards. Uh, we're going to have a good discussion with him coming up. Uh, I know you and I both uh, really, really enjoyed uh, his directorial debut, so I can't wait to chop him up with that. With Her name is Krista. But aside from that, I mean... It's been a lot of being at the house. Uh, I I found a kitten in my yard. I found it a family. I, that was my good deed of the week. Like uh, there's been this, there's been this incessant crying coming from under my deck, and I'm like, what the hell is that? I could tell it's a cat. You know, I have cats, but I couldn't get the cat to come out. So I've been leaving it food and water for a few days. And after a few days of that, it decided to trust me and come out. And it was like this little tiny kitten. So I brought it inside and I made a post on Facebook and. Within an hour, found him a, a loving family with a nice little older sister cat, and they gave her a bath and all kinds of treats and toys. They've been sending me all kinds of pictures of her playing, so that was my good date of the week. <laughs> Very exciting. Sounds like a good week. So far, so good. Making How's it about you? work. Oh, my goodness gracious gravy. I'm uh, killing it over here as a drug and alcohol counselor and you know, getting people to detox, getting people to rehab. Life is feeling really good right now. I'm really happy about everything. Um, so that is a little bit of my shoot life for you that you don't. Not everybody knows about, but I'm so excited about how things are going. I had to share. Um, but in the meantime, let's talk about some movies before we get to our amazing guests because uh, her name was Krista, and uh, our guest, the director, the filmmaker. It's going to be an awesome show, and we're glad you're here, Real Vile Land to uh share it with us uh hey ruthless chris what you been watching baby so the first one i'm gonna talk about i touched on it last week but uh it was shark week so i wasn't able to talk about it but i do want to talk about this because i had a lot of fucking fun with it um as as listeners know um i'm a big fan of the watchers film uh with Corey uh uh Haim. yeah Haim. Uh, uh, this and uh, Michael Ironside, you know, you got a Sasquatch and a dog, and it's a uh, it was a good movie. So I decided to finally watch Watchers Two on Tubi. Kind of always wanted to check out the rest of the series. I know it's a trilogy. I haven't got to part three yet. Uh, boy, it was Watchers Two, an interesting, fun ride. Uh, directed by Theria Knotts, who only directed three other films. Uh, one being a movie I liked called The Terror Within, which is a James Cameron joint. Um, but the other one's a war movie. The other one's a Spanish movie that looks like it's about cowboys. Um, this movie was a fucking, it was a watch. Uh, they ditched the Sasquatch. They still have the dog still played by a cute golden retriever. This time it's Einstein too, not perfect. Uh, but the, um, monster that attracted to it is no longer a Sasquatch. It's more like a mutant with the most giant stupidest looking weird mouth like the mouth comes all the way down to the middle of its chest and it looks you know what it looks like uh remember when in robocop the guy got hit by the um the toxic waste and he looks like a melted sludge of a man the mo the monster looks like that the entire movie and they show it a lot like they are not shy with how shitty this thing looks like it's it's jumping through windows at the most inappropriate times and like ripping people up um, a lot of blood in this thing. The guy that stars in it 
Um, he's one of those guys you can't tell if he's 28 or 49. Um, he looks like Christopher Titus. Remember the comedian Christopher Titus uh, mixed with maybe James Woods? Um, but they get they make him dress like Guile from Street Fighter the whole time. So he's like a, a escaped military prisoner. So he's got fatigues. He's got the like a white tank top on, and then he's got his hair spiked up like fucking Guile. Um, the the beats kind of copy the first watchers a little bit. You know, they find the dog, fall in love with the dog, realize it's so smart. Monsters coming after the dog. We're not going to let the monster get the dog. We're going to have to let it survive. Um, what happens in between is a cacophony of silliness uh, to the highest degree. Um, it isn't by no means a good film, but it is a goddamn entertaining film. One I will probably watch again. Um, I watched on Tubi. I gave it three stars. Uh, I would recommend it. Uh, be in the mood for like a like a goopy, silly monster flick. Uh, this is definitely a popcorn flick. You know, like the if your friends are in a silly mood and you want to, you know, there's a bunch of you want to make fun of something on the TV. It's that kind of film. So yeah, Watchers too. Check it out. What about you? Mm -hmm. What have you been watching? Very cool. Uh, yeah, no. First, I want to check out Watchers too because that sounds like a sounds like a jam and a half. Sounds like the type of thing I want to invite people over for to watch. Hopefully, there's a collector's edition Blu-ray out there. But in the meantime, I'll have to watch it for free on Tubi. You said three stars, right? Three stars. Very, very cool. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to talk about 1989's uh, directorial debut or at least a f major um, full-length motion picture debut from Bob Balaban. And uh, it is the cannibalistic movie Parents. Uh, I, yeah. swore, I swear that I had seen this movie before, and I'm sure I have, but it's probably when I was drinking. And when you're drinking, you can't really consume cinema the way that you should be. Because watching this sober, it came across as a totally different film. Uh, and I remember that seeing the VHS package a lot when I was a kid. And it looks like the type of movie that I would have loved, but I never rented. I remember never renting it. Uh, you know, uh, was it... Uh, Randy Quaid is in it. He's amazing. Mary Beth Hurt, Sandy Dennis. Uh, it's just so smart and well done. And it, it but it's very, very weird. It's a bizarre <laughs> movie. Um, but I, I love it for how bizarre it is. It's so well done. Um, and I'm glad that the Vestron series, uh, put out a, a, a director uh like a deluxe collector's edition of this because watching the um watching the making of uh featurettes it was nice to hear that the um the writer actually intended this more as an allegory or subtext about uh alcoholism and child abuse and domestic abuse not actually about cannibalistic parents because if you don't know if you're not familiar with the film it takes place in the 1950s it's a period piece and it's about a family living in suburbia trying to fit in and they've got cannibalistic tendencies but you know when you watch it sober and as an adult you realize that that's not what this is about at all and it's a brilliant film uh i highly recommend it uh, if you don't have the physical copy or if you don't feel like buying the physical copy because it is a weird movie, it is for free on Tubi. Uh, so you've got no excuses not to watch this one, and I give it four stars. Uh, Ruthless Chris, have you watched Parents? Absolutely. Uh, I own a copy of this. Uh, this uh, You can find it most easily on there's those four packs of like cult movies. Um, I have it on one of that with, I believe like blood diner and earth girls are easy. And I forget what the other one, I think it's sundowners that weird Bruce Campbell vampire movie. Um, yeah, this one's a lot of fun. Um, it's interesting cause it's told from the child's point of view and he's not really sure if they're actual cannibals or not for a while, you know, like it's, he's not sure if he's just, you know, like he just knows something's up with his parents. And, uh, you know, by the cover of this thing, it almost looks like a John Waters film. Like the way the cover looks, like you, you get, it's just like a, a mom and dad pulling food out, but like there's just something unsettling and off about it. You're like, what the fuck? Um, I highly recommend it. It's definitely a lot of fun. Uh, I would give it four as well. Very, very cool. Uh, so yeah, 
Highly recommended. Watch Parents. Do it now. Ruthless Chris, what do you got for us, baby? Uh, next, I'm going to talk about a TV show. Um, I really w- liked when it first came out. They have since added it to Tubi, and I have dived back into it and started it again from the beginning. Um, just because I didn't get all the way to the end of it the first time, and I didn't want to start back where I had left off with it being like such a gap in time. Uh, this is 2013's Hannibal. Uh, the series. Um, this show is criminally underrated. Um, it is a gorgeous, violent, brutal TV show with top notch acting. Um, you know, normally, you know, I'm the guy wallowing in the mud here, but like, like this is, this is about as good as it gets when it comes to TV horror. Uh, a lot of TV horror doesn't really land with me. I, I really don't like the American horror stories. I didn't give a shit about the walking dead. Um, but this one really resonated with me. Um, like the the directors they bring in for this thing are all top notch directors. Like uh, one of the guys who did six episodes, he was a, he's the director of photography for like Quentin Tarantino and Robert Rodriguez and like all the top guys. Uh, he did every single Baltimore Del Toro movie, like Pan's Labyrinth and all that. So like these guys aren't slouches, and it comes through. Like it's I would keen it to a much more violent and brutal True Detective. The for only the first season of True Detective. It's very keen. Um, But how it starts is this is pre-Hannibal being in prison. Um, It follows a detective named Will Graham. Um, He is basically kind of like an autistic detective to where he has bad social skills, but he's very good at like picking up on clues and stuff. And they have a very visual way of telling this where you see colors swipe the screen and then like evidence starts like disappearing and backing up. And you can see him like kind of recreating what happened in his mind to kind of figure out where it all happened and stuff. Um, and Hannibal Lecter as it starts is kind of a, um, consultant for the FBI. Um, Lawrence Fishburg character brings him in uh, and Hannibal's played by Mads McKellen, who is, I think a phenomenal fucking actor. Yeah. I think he's one of the top actors working today. Uh, so it's, it's just kind of where that goes from there. Um, cannibalism is a huge set piece in this, but the Hannibal character is, they build his story in the background till it becomes the foreground. And that's what makes this thing very cool. And all the other serial killers, they, they cover why they're covering this Hannibal story. All have like these really interesting ways of killing people. Uh, there's really artistic set pieces, uh, it moves fast. It's extremely violent and brutal for something that was on network television. I mean, like it's, it, it was much more violent than like Dexter and stuff like that. Um, I highly, highly recommend this show. Um, you know, I had Jillian Anderson, I had Lawrence Fishburne, Mads McKellen, top notch crew, even, um, Scott Thompson from kids in the hall plays a corner in this thing, which is really fun to see, uh, him in more of a serious role. He's still like wisecracking, but I cannot recommend this This is probably one of my favorite series. I give it a five go on Tubi. It's also on Hulu and watch it immediately. Well, I have to do that because I've never watched it. I tried watching the first episode, couldn't get into it, and never went back to it. But upon recommendation of you, Mr. Ruthless Chris, I, Mr. Germ to Ripper, may have to reevaluate my viewing pleasure of Hannibal because that sounds, everything you said sounds very tantalizing. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious gravy. Uh, The next movie I'm going to talk about is a little bit crazy. Uh, It is 1972's, directed by Bob Clark, zombie kind of Night of the Living Dead ripoff, uh, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. Uh, It is a wild movie, and you can tell it's uh, extremely independent, extremely low budget. And uh, I, I think it's a lot of fun because a lot of movies have taken from this uh, have taken from this sense, you know, uh, that with it's about basically six friends and they're in a theatrical troupe and they dig up a corpse on an abandoned island to use in a mock satanic rite. It backfires with deadly consequences. These deadly consequences are specifically the dead coming back to life and hunting down this theatrical troupe. Um, I, I didn't watch this movie in years, and I forgot how wacky it is. Um, but it, it it was fun to have people over and watch it together. You know, I got the 4K UHD uh, version that just came out recently. 
I had to buy it. It was on sale through one of the many websites that I'm always buying movies from. But revisiting it now and watching it, once again, watching a movie sober, <laughs> uh, I got to enjoy it more. And uh, just knowing that, one, this movie is rated PG. Mm -hmm. um, this movie would definitely not be PG if it came out nowadays. Uh, I don't know how they rated movies in 1972, but, you know, there's gore, there's blood, there's drug use, there's satanic rites. Um, this <laughs> this would definitely not be rated PG in 2023. 1972 must have been a wild time. Uh, <laughs> but also knowing that this came from the same director that made uh, Porky's, made A Christmas Story, and made uh, probably the one of the most suspenseful movies that you know predated uh, the uh, American slasher boom, and was uh, a Canadian film that was you know definitely uh, borrowed heavily from Italian Shallow, uh, Black Christmas. So knowing that he did Porky's Black Christmas and a Christmas Story, and children shouldn't play with dead things, I think uh, Bob Clark. Uh, has got to be considered like one of the greatest directors of all time just for that. Um, now, uh, Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things has, you know, it has its flaws, of course, because this was only his second feature film he ever made, uh, but it is a lot of fun, and uh, luckily it's streaming on most free platforms, or it's streaming on a free platform, so you can watch it on Plex. Uh, or rent it from Prime Video for 99 cents. It's well worth it. Uh, I bought the physical copy, and it's definitely worth it. Uh, I gave it three stars, though, just because it, it, there, there, it could have been better, but you know, it just uh, lacks a little focus. Other than that, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Chris, it seems like you've watched Children Shouldn't Play With Dead Things. I have. Um, I, as well, think Bob Clark is a highly... Like, you know, everyone knows him from A Christmas Story, but, like, Black Christmas is probably, like, one of the best slasher films ever made. Like, it, it is a master class in suspense and horror. Uh, but to know that he can uh, that he could jump between all these genres and do them all well, because, you know, Porky's, full-on sex comedy, you know, uh, uh, Christmas Story, full-on family Christmas movie, very clean. Black Christmas, very dark, bleak horror movie and then so children shouldn't play with dead things which i think is more of like a mead spirited kind of comedy horror um and to, to answer your question i think it's just because pg-13 didn't exist in the 70s that came along in the 80s you know um i think it just wasn't hard enough to be an r but you know it definitely shouldn't have been a pg and i think that's why swamp thing is pg but it has boobs in it you know <laughs> it's just like what you were able to get away with but yeah i, I find it to be a very entertaining film it's definitely cool to see his take on zombies. Uh, that, and this was definitely before the oversaturation of zombie movies started happening and all that. And, you know, Bob Clark is a, a master director. So, I, yeah, I'd recommend it. I'd probably give it three and a half. Sweet. Yeah, so if you haven't seen Children Shan't Play With Dead Things, you've got no excuse. It's streaming for free on Plex. Or get your hands on a physical copy so you can watch those extras. In the meantime, let's keep this terror train of chugging along. Uh, Ruthless Chris, one more round, will you? Uh, what you've been watching baby so i'm gonna go back to a movie uh i didn't watch it recently but it stuck with me and i i wasn't able to talk to it up to this point just because there was so much going on in theme episodes and whatnot you know with uh pride month and then the, the shark movies and stuff it didn't really fit in either of those categories but uh it's a movie that you showed me uh mr germ t ripper um when we were out in chicago running our show take as needed for pain the crew and i uh, you graciously put us up in your home theater area and you put this movie on for us and we could have not had a better time. It was the perfect movie to put on. And this is um, 2019's Butt Boy by Tyler Kornack. Um, this movie is hysterically dry um, is the best way I could describe it. It is the funniest movie. It has a strange, strange premise but they do it all extremely straight faced. Um, like it's, and it's, it's actually very well done for the, the budget they have and what the subject matter is, but you have, God, it's hard to even describe how this goes uh, without it sounding silly, but it, it, it's definitely a keen to almost like a Cohen style meets like attack of the killer tomatoes ish 
meets I don't know, but it's done like almost in a British straightforward way. That's it's hard to describe this movie, but Butt Boy is about a man finds out or has a a, a pension for sticking things in his butt. But not only does he stick things in his butt, when he when they go up there, they go to like this other dimension that is within his butt. So like he's not just sticking up, you know, like dildos and stuff like there's animals that take off of there, like people and like they get stuck and lost in this butt dimension and he just can't help himself so he's kind of like a serial killer with his butt and then they have a a, an interesting dynamic i'm that i've never seen really done in a horror movie before where the detective um uh uh investigating him you know he's a very hard nose wet hair always slick back brown leather jacket smoking cigarettes with pinky rings kind of scumbaggy cop you always see but he's in rehab or he's going to AA meetings because he wants to get over alcohol. Well, Butt Boy is going to AA meetings because he needs that support, but for a very different reason. Butt Boy ends up being his sponsor. So the guy the cop is looking for is also his sponsor. He finds out the cop's looking for him. He's trying to avoid this guy, but these guys also rely on him. So you got these two people that are dependent on each other, but also like are kind of mortal enemies. Uh, it's, 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 quite an interesting dynamic um we played this to a room full of people it wasn't just germ and i um it was my entire ring crew my referee um you know one of my business partners we were laughing hysterically through the time we could not have had a better time with this movie uh, i give it four and a half uh loved every minute of this fucking thing that's why i had to wait to bring up i was originally going to talk about bloodletting uh, a movie james l edwards is in that we're going to talk but i figure we're going to talk about it later so i'm going to leave that out and we're talking about Butt Boy. Highly recommend Butt Boy. Yeah, Butt Boy is one of those movies that I really didn't know much about. And um, there, there, it was in one sale or another that it was, it, I was just like, I can't not buy a movie called Butt Boy. You know what I mean? And thankfully, the movie is a film noir and it's completely absurdist and it's played completely straight. And it's got so many unique twists and turns that you don't expect. And everything about this movie is completely unique. I love turning people on to it because you don't expect anything like it from the title Butt Boy. You expect something silly. And it's it, it's a ridiculous premise. It's absurdist in its premise, but it's not really silly. You know what I mean? It's laughable at times, but it's not silly. Um, yeah, I love this movie, Butt Boy, and I love turning people on to it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I give it five stars. You know, a film noir uh, genre film that it, it's got that cat and mouse between the criminal and the detective and the like all the characters have such a like a almost like a deep, rich backstory that it's like you don't expect any of this from a movie called Butt Boy. <laughs> Um, do you know did. if it's... Oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, that's fine. I was just going to say, do you know if it's streaming anywhere? Uh, it looks like uh, only it's only to buy or rent, so you can do like Apple or uh, Amazon or Voodoo and any of that. Um, the one thing I will point out, though, is like on paper, this shouldn't work. In the wrong director's hands, it wouldn't work. But the other thing about it is it's actually incredibly well acted, too. Like, it is everything fucking works in this movie and it shouldn't none of it should work none of it so yeah well i'm hoping to uh you know tyler Cor uh cornack uh directed it wrote it directed it um the only thing it looks like he's done besides that is tiny cinema and if i'm not mistaken uh, that's an anthology film i believe so i've not seen it yeah. myself but i so did look I into see if there was anything else he had made after watching butt boy Right. I, I want to check it out just because it's such a bizarre premise that is done so well, executed so well. Uh, I need I need this man to make more films, <laughs> you know. Um, but anyways, yeah, we love Butt Boy. You give it four and a half. I give it five. Uh, track it down, rent it, buy it, do anything you can to watch Get Butt Boy in your eyeballs because you will uh, be grateful for that fact. It is a sci-fi fantasy crime thriller. You know, I love it when genres just throw everything against the wall and keep going. Uh, but to wrap this up, before we get to our guest, I'm going to talk about one more movie 
It is a punk exploitation slasher made at the height of slasher movies or when every holiday got a slasher movie. It is 1980s New Year's Evil. Uh, yeah, this movie uh, actually is a lot smarter than I remember it. And I don't remember it very well because the first time I rented it on VHS, uh, me and two friends split a bottle of tequila on uh, New Year's Eve. And I, uh, my best friend just kept telling me that I kept saying, I love this movie. I don't really remember watching it. <laughs> um, but yeah, for those of you who don't know, during a New Year's Eve celebration, a Los Angeles disc jockey receives a phone call saying that when New Year's Eve strikes in each time zone, someone will be murdered and she will be the last one. Um, yeah, the twists and turns in this movie, uh, I didn't see coming actually, uh, which I, I enjoyed. There are some great iconic uh, imagery that has been used uh, on t-shirts and posters and so on and so forth that uh, is great to actually see in the movie again. Cast is great. Uh, and I like the soundtrack a lot too, because it is a punk exploitation film. You know, you got punks pogoing and moshing and stuff in uh I was watching this with a, a group of friends uh, a couple of days ago. And, uh, you know, it was funny because there, there's like, they switch it up. They go like from a metal, like a hair metal song to a blues song. And then they have like the punk band on. It does a great song. I, I can't remember the name of it. Um, made in Japan, I think was the name of the band though. And I'm sure it was just a made up band for the movie. But I thoroughly enjoyed New Year's Evil way more than I thought that... I guess Drunk Jeremy was right. He, I love this movie. <laughs> but so funny good. story. <laughs> my, uh, I remember my mom having to help nurse me back to health the next day and telling me, tequila will to kill you. <laughs> and uh, I felt like I was dying. <laughs> but uh, anyways... Um, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, New Year's Evil, and it's streaming on Pluto TV for free. So if you haven't seen it, check it out on there. I gave it three stars. Uh, Ruthless Chris, have you seen New Year's Evil? I have um, a few times. Uh, I very much enjoy this movie, too. It is a gritty, mean piece of dirty cinema, and I really like that about it. De yeah, definitely very punk rock, very DIY. Um, it's not. It, it doesn't get talked about enough. I don't think, you know, it, it really, you know, everyone knows the cover of it. Everyone's seen the cover of it, but doesn't really, the film itself doesn't really seem to get the love that it should when everyone knows the imagery from it, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, I really love it. I'd recommend it. I'll give it three and a half. Very, very cool. Well, that's about us for uh, chugging down the terror train lane over here in Real Vileland. Now let's get our guest on, Mr. James L. Edwards. And now for our feature presentation. Whoa, 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 everybody. We're back and better than ever. It's your pals here at Real Vile, and we've got a special guest with us today. On this episode of Real Vile, we will be talking to uh, writer, director, actor, producer, everything and all above filmmaker, Andy Darling, and I cannot wait to get going talking about all of his wonderful films, Mr. James L. Edwards. James, welcome to Real Vile. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, now, for those people in real vile land that aren't as familiar with your body of work, uh, could you give them a little background on who you are, what's going on, and all that jazz? Absolutely. Um, I started out as an actor uh, for uh, uh, J.R. Bookholder and basically low-budget uh, independent horror films. Uh, that was in, I believe, 1985. And by the 90s, I was writing screenplays uh, for both him as well as uh, Pete Jackalone uh, out of New Jersey, and uh, then later uh, Brad Twig out of uh, Maryland. Um, and at that point, I, I guess it was, uh, uh, well, my, my directorial debut, her name was Krista, came out in uh, uh, 2020. And uh, so, so I'm just try trying to do as much as I possibly can. <laughs> Now, when you first started out, you know, um, the, the J.R. Bookwalter stuff, uh, you know, it was fiercely independent, you know, like uh, what you guys were doing is self-budgeted, 
um, you know, on camcorder, you know, like real, you know, by the bootstraps filmmaking. Um, did you find it like, you know, like kind of liberating to, to, to kind of be able to do what you guys need to do to, to make those kind of movies? I, uh, what was your first one with Book Walter? First one that I did, technically the first feature was The Dead Next Door, his first feature. But I had come aboard uh, for his last like in indie short film, which was a, uh, a short film called uh, Tomorrow. And, uh, um, but, uh, but no, I started out as a uh, production assistant. I actually started out as a special effects makeup artist uh, on The Dead Next Door. And again, I was 12 years old. I had no clue what the hell I was doing. But uh, what I did do very well was lie. And I basically, they were, they were <laughs> like, um, yeah, yeah, have you ever worked with foam latex? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I've done that. And then a couple of weeks in, they realized that I had no clue what I was doing, but they liked my spirit, so they kept me aboard as a production assistant. But um, but to answer your question, um, as far as it being liberating, yes and no. It's one of those things where essentially, you do, it's nice not to, I mean, obviously more money, less control you have of the project. Yes. But at the same token, you really have to be resourceful with a lot of these budgets. So that's that's the that's the the biggest problem. Yeah, I mean, you guys you guys raise the money yourselves. You, you you know, a lot of you guys were, you know, maybe seasoned, you know, special like you said special effects artists, actors, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure it was relying on who was around you and what you guys could do for each other just to make it work. Oh, and absolutely. That kind of spirit of camaraderie. So uh, uh, you start out with uh, doing some of the book Walter stuff. And as you get older, you start getting more and more prominent roles. Um, mm -hmm. I believe the, the first one I really remember you from was Polymorph. Yeah. Yeah. That was actually my first script for book Walter as well. Uh, that was one of those where um, uh, the nice thing about being a screenwriter, but also being an actor is you can write yourself in all the best roles. So it's one of those things where, it was pretty obvious when he, I thought it was pretty obvious when I wrote the script who I was going to end up playing, but I'd mostly been playing either the wisecracking best friend or the villain. So when they got the script, they're like, okay, so you'll be playing Carlos. I'm like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to play Ted. And they're like, oh, we, 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 we don't see you as Ted. I'm like, really? Cause I, I pretty much wrote him <laughs> to where nobody else can play him, but me. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's funny sometimes how somebody can have a whole different perspective when they look at it with their set of eyes. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, you've, you've written several scripts now. Um, like you said, J.R. Bookwalter's made a few. Some uh, some other uh, filmmaker friends you know have, have made a few. Mm -hmm. What was it that made you decide, hey, I'm going to step into the director's chair. I'm going to take control of this. And uh, your first featured name, uh, uh, Fritcher Film, her name was Krista. Uh, what made you take that leap from being more an on-screen guy? I mean, you still starred in the movie, but but mm -hmm. you picked up all the other, the, the writing and the directing as well. And I'm sure you wore a lot of other hats behind the scenes as well. That's one of those things that honestly, um, it, it, it was, it, that's, a, that's kind of a twofold uh, answer on that. Number one, uh, I always am appreciative of getting a, the, the opportunity to act in someone's film or for that matter, get the opportunity to write someone's screenplay. The problem is, it never turns out the way you picture it when you write it. You know, I, yeah. I and that's not the fault of the director. Obviously, they want to put their own spin on it. You know, I, I guess I was just tired of writing screenplays and then seeing the finished product and being like, well, it's good, but, you know. And as yeah. an actor, I just want to play a, a different array of act uh, of, uh, of uh, characters. So the best way to do that is to direct your own project. That and the fact that, be, to be perfectly honest with you, it's one of those things where if you want to make a living doing this, you can't do it as an actor. You probably can't do it as a screenwriter, at least on this level. But if yeah. you own your own films, then you have a fighting chance. So I like, to, to be perfectly honest with you, I like the idea of, doing something that I enjoy and not punching a, punching a clock to do it. So that that's, yeah. that's basically was the, the decision of being a director. I had heard uh, to your point that the, the, the original idea for polymorph was something completely different than what it, the, the finished movie ended up being. Um, I believe it was, uh, I watched the DVD extras, I believe, and they had talked about it being uh, something like completely different. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I had written that script too. What had happened was, 
JR had a treatment for, uh, it was probably like a seven page uh, treatment for polymorph. And I was asked to write the script. It was, a, he, I had written a couple of scripts on my own at that point, but I hadn't written anything for JR. So it was really important to me to, to basically turn in something that he'd be happy with. So I took that treatment and did not alter a single thing. I just wrote it exactly the way the treatment was. I mean, obviously, I put my own dialogue in it and everything, but as far as the situations that happened in the film, that was strictly exactly how it was in the treatment. And I turned it in, and Ariana Albright just absolutely annihilated it. Said it was a total piece of crap, hated it. And I'm like, okay, well... Uh, and, and between you and me, it honestly was... She didn't like her part in it. <laughs> so, oh. <laughs> so it was one of those things where, all right, um, give me another two weeks. Let me make some changes on my own. Let me stray outside of this formula and let's see what happens. And that's how we ended up with uh, the polymorph that we ended up making. It's a shame, too, because with polymorph possibly, um, uh, uh, well, it's probably going to be next year. It's coming to, to Blu-ray. Um, I was hoping that I could find that old screenplay, the original screenplay. And unfortunately, I don't have a copy of it. JR doesn't have a copy of it. And I actually reached out to Ariana. She doesn't have a copy of it. So those are the only three people I know that, that might. So it unfortunately may be lost to time. That's, that's a shame. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk bloodletting for a little bit? Oh, absolutely. So one of your favorite or, or one of my favorite films that you starred in is a uh you know a little low budget film but it has a lot a lot going on for it um was bloodletting uh it was you and ariana albright mm -hmm. um i said that right right i'm sorry uh, ariana but yeah yeah ariana, okay um because she's she's uh kind of in that same circle of you know the same movies that you guys star and you all kind of help each other in each other's movies oh absolutely um, but it, it focuses primarily on you guys and it it is essentially a love story between two psychopathic people um and you know the the cracks and the the disturbing things that could happen between those kind the love between those kinds of things but one of the things i did notice as a theme between a lot of your movies uh and i'm not sure if you wrote that script or not but mm -hmm. especially with krista and uh brimstone coven was it it feels like um a lot of the the films have like a circle around tragic love between like really disturbed people oh absolutely yeah and that um now i didn't write uh bloodletting but matt walsh who did he and i have a very similar style as far as that goes and i think both of us suck in relationships so so that's why i think we both tend to, to write about doomed romance um but no no you that's absolutely true i i even uh, uh what was it i i don't think there's been anything that i've personally written that hasn't had some kind of doomed romantic situation in it so yeah it, it definitely seems to be an overarching theme uh in, in the work uh uh definitely uh, especially with your your most recent uh directorial uh you know i mean uh bloodlighting people people kind of compared it a little bit to natural born killers but i feel like it had more of a um gritty like punkness to it if that makes sense you know I like guess, yeah and don't and, get me wrong love natural born killers uh, but it's one of those things where i was always honored when people said it was the no budget uh, natural born killers but at the same token i kind of liked the idea with bloodletting where it focused more on the relationship and the killing was almost like an afterthought kind of yeah. thing um like in my idea honestly because at one time we wanted to do a sequel to it and I had the idea, well, let's make it a trilogy and make the second one about marriage and make the third one about uh, parenthood. And oh, unfortunately, God. unfortunately, it never came to be. And uh, we, we both, Ariana and I got too old to, <laughs> to play the characters anymore. So, uh, you know, And it, it seems like uh, Walsh himself, I mean, he didn't really direct much after that. Uh, he went more into the, the writing uh, side of things as well. Walsh, and again, I, I hate to say this, but it is, I mean, it's, it's well documented. Um, Walsh was an absolutely phenomenal writer, just an absolutely amazing screenwriter. As a director, he just, in my opinion, did not have the spine for it. And I say that as, because in the 90s, I, I mean, I, I freely admit, the 90s, 
I was kind of an egotistical asshole, to be perfectly honest with you. And between my ego and Ariana's ego, we ate him alive. I mean, we absolutely <laughs> did. And looking back now, especially directing my own films, it was absolutely the wrong thing to do. And I personally think a lot of the reason that Matt didn't direct anymore was because he's like, I don't want to deal with this. And it's like, I mean, I can't, I, I've been very fortunate. I've never had that situation on my sets, but I, I'm sure it's coming. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, it seems like uh, uh, with the movies you're now directing, you're doing almost what Book Walter did, where you have your own universe of actors that you mm -hmm. you use between films, you know, um, um, uh, uh, like watching uh, uh, Brimstone Coven and um, um, her name was Krista, a lot of the same faces were popping up just in different roles. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, it, it, it felt like you have like your own similar universe where you're you're finding your people to, to, to make these movies around almost like Book Walter did. Oh, uh, absolutely. It, it's, it's kind of the best of both worlds for me because I get the opportunity to use new people that I have discovered on my own as well as using old Tempe uh, favorites as well. Like I've, I've worked with Sasha Graham on every movie that I've done. I've worked with, uh, I, I got JR to do a cameo in, uh, in Krista as well as uh, Barb Norod from skinned alive. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's been, uh, I, I've been fortunate to have a really great group of people. And that, and the fact that to be honest with you, I love the idea of just having a stable group of actors that I can say, okay, when I write something, I can say, okay, well, I already know he's going to play that, and she's going to play this, and just kind of go from there. And that you can depend on him. You already have a working re relationship, shorthand, all that fun stuff. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So let's talk uh, uh, your first feature, then. Uh, her name was Krista. Um, both Jerm and I watched it very recently. You uh, were nice enough to send us a screener copy, but I did notice that you can also watch it on Tubi, mm -hmm. uh, oh. along with your other film. Uh, so And almost all the movies we talked about tonight. Oh yeah, polymorphs on there. Um, I don't think is that De yeah, Dead Next Door is on there. Um, <laughs> Robot Ninja, Zombie Cop, all of them are on there. I think all the Tempe films are officially on there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is Tempe's not around anymore? Is it? It's technically uh, make flicks now. Tempe is, although uh, with um, with Jr.'s new film, uh, side effects may vary. I think Tempe Entertainment is uh, is coming back. I don't think that's going to be considered a make flicks film. So when we're talking Krista, I want to kind of tiptoe as we speak about this because I don't really want to ruin anything that really happens in that movie. Otherwise, I think it kind of draws the power away from it. You know, right. I, I think um, the way that you directed it was definitely a bait and switch kind of situation. That's oh, about 100. the most I'll say about it. Yeah, I, I love the idea of, of basically fusing two genres together that really have no business being together and i especially liked it the way amazon set it up because with you being familiar with the ending yeah you, you, you'll appreciate this for a while because it's listed as both a horror film as well as a romantic drama people were getting notifications saying hey if you liked uh, uh if you liked uh, you got mail <laughs> then you'll love her name was Krista. So some of the reviews on there were hysterical, just absolutely amazing. I was thrilled. So I love the fact that I ruined several people's nights. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and this isn't going to ruin it because it is the opening. Um, you know something is going to go wrong by how it opens because it is right. your character. You can tell that he is in some sort of treatment center, or psych ward, something tragic happened. And even by the name, her name was. Mm -hmm. so you know something's going to happen, but the majority of the film is more of a character study and um, like a like a slow burn character study where you, you but you don't really know where it's going to go. You know, it's like two very broken people on very two different ends of the spectrum of, of why they have their problems and then them find a way to connect and then where it goes from there and right but the fact that you say that it um it was being recommended to people uh who liked like <laughs> like if you if you like the notebook you're gonna love her, her name was krista <laughs> i i wish i had been in the living room to some of those people uh by the last half hour because a lot of them did write you know i love the first hour of this movie <laughs> but after that i don't think this should be allowed on amazon <laughs> Now you had to commit to quite a haircut in that. Obviously, you That's really awesome. shaved your head. 
I How ended long up did you rock that do. I on and off because we ran into a lot of the movie took two uh, two years to make, and then another like year and a half after that of uh, in trying to sell the thing. So on and off, I had to wear that for like two years, and it's one of those things where not only did I have to have that that awful haircut. I also had the pedophile mustache, and I had I pu- I put on forty pounds for the role, and it was one of those things where it's like, oh god, what what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it, it really did have some BTK killer vibes, like right around when all that was going on. Too. Like, <laughs> that could have been an easy look for you to rock. It was not. It pretty much made me undateable for two years. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah, it was. It was a very lonely two years for James L. Edwards. But hey, I mean, maybe it put you in the headspace you needed to for your character because that was a lot of what was going on with him, you know? Well, that was, and again, that was my own foolishness too because it's like, it's my directorial debut. So it's like, but I also wrote possibly the meekest character I've ever written. So that being said, it's like the minute I call action, I have to go into introvert mode. And then when I call cut, I'm in charge of everything. It's like, ah, shit, you know? (laughs) It's got to snap in between the two. Right. <laughs> I know uh, uh, Germ uh, watched it today, and he had some thoughts on it. You want to chime in on anything, Germ? Uh, well, I, I, once again, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to say too much because uh, it, it is an excellent film, and it goes places that I wasn't expecting. Uh, I was like, I'll tell you that uh, straight up that I was like, oh, this is going to be some sort of pretty woman, something or rather, with like. Uh, a slasher twist right uh, and when it went to where it went to it brought to mind other films that i'm, I'm not going to mention because if i do it'll ruin it right um that those films have an artsy edge to them mm-hmm. whereas this one has characters that you care about and characters that make sense and are more realistic and therefore make the situation feel more realistic and right. I like that a lot, um, mm-hmm. you know, and like your character of Steven, it's a very identifiable with a lot of people. I feel like, you know, that just live their day in and day out lives. Uh, when you were writing uh, Steven, you said like it was the most meek character you ever wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your mindset in creating this guy then? The, the, when I first came up with the idea for Her Name Was Krista, I had just turned 40. I was in the middle of my second divorce. I had mo- I was unemployed. And I had had to move back in with my parents with my three kids. And I woke up on my, uh, on my uh, 40th birthday and I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize the guy in the mirror. And I'm like, shit, is this it? Is this how it ends? And I basically thought, you know, what would be the absolute worst at this point? What could, what, where could this go at this point? And that's when I kind of came up with the idea of, uh, again, the, the, for me, the horror element of Krista, and I know a lot of people don't agree with this, the horror element of Krista is getting older and being alone and being lonely. That, to me, terrifies me more, much, much more than what happens in the end. You know, and my goal with the script, too, was, I want to make a character that you don't necessarily agree with what he's doing, but you 100% understand why he's doing yes. it. Kind of. No. Uh, yeah. Being a 45 year old man myself, I I could uh, definitely see where, where that, you know, where that character is coming from. You know, he's got his life in all in order, but at the same time, you, you want to go out of order once in a while. And right. He, he, he does what he has to do just to get a date and you know one thing leads to another and he doesn't want to give up on love <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i'll put it that way he doesn't want to give up on love <laughs> and i love that i love that about that i mean again i always feel bad because i could sit here and talk about her name was krista for days and and that's so typically when I see a director or even an actor that's like that's like okay okay we get it we get it you love your own movie, but this is one of those few cases where it turned out pretty much exactly. It actually I won't even say that it it um it turned out better than I was hoping that it would. So and it's very rare in this business where you get that. 
Absolutely. I watch a lot of like indie, no budget, micro budget uh, films, genre films. And I'll tell you, uh, her name was Krista is one of the best I've ever seen. Uh, you know, and I was blown away about like how good you, I didn't even realize that was you because I'd watched um, Brimstone Incorporated right before this. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it took me a second. I was like, wait, is that guy in the diner the same guy from the diner in the last? <laughs> Holy crap, it is the same guy. Oh, so I love that you recreated like that atmosphere too with the waitress. And it's both of you same still waitress. in the diner. I thought that was really smart and clever. I, that um, was that was actually probably the most fun I had making Brimstone was recreating that down to the same waitress, uh, and uh, I love that idea. I've actually, um, believe it or not, I've got a treatment. I, I don't think we'll ever be able to raise the budget for it, but I've got a treatment for a sequel to Krista, where the the waitress actually comes back in it. So it's like I I I, lo I love like I said I I love callbacks. I'm a big fan of that. I was just gonna say, uh, besides uh, the fact that you're you you blew me away with your acting chops uh your cast is great we already discussed how that you have a, a certain cast that you keep using or like at least you've used in these two films um drew fortier who mm. played uh nick in this uh he he was, blew my blew me away in both films he he really stole the show uh how did you come across drew i was very fortunate that when we were casting uh krista um a uh, a fan had reached out and basically uh, he's like look I i'm not an actor i'm a guitarist i uh, i i'm in uh, chuck mosley's band uh, from uh, the original singer from faith no more and he's like i'd really like to audition for this film i'm like absolutely that'd, that'd be great so i actually ended up meeting him at chuck mosley's house uh, he was uh, living in cleveland uh, Drew's from Indiana, though, and what ended up happening was uh, he, uh, what was it? He did his audition, and he's. Uh, I've I've worked with him ever since. I I just absolutely love him. He's. Uh, I I was in his film Dwellers that uh, that uh, came out a while ago. Um, uh, yeah, Drew's my lucky rabbit's foot. Any chance, any time. I mean, I I use the same cast typically all the time, but I won't do a movie without Drew. Uh, he's just he's absolutely amazing. The only thing that I uh, I always feel bad about, and I hope I've changed that with this next one. Um, I always try and give my cast a different type of role with each movie, and Drew's just so good with the like smart ass kind of uh, kind of. A scumbag with a bag of uh, with a uh, uh, heart of gold uh, uh, role. It's difficult to put him in any place else. But in the, new, in, the in our new movie, Trivial, I think you're going to see side of him, and he's he's absolutely amazing. He's fantastic. So very it's cool. Uh, I just have to throw this in here. It's interesting you say he played uh, guitar with Chuck Mosley because about two months before he passed, I saw them at a bar here in Toledo. I live in Toledo, Ohio. Um, oh, really? Okay called the Ottawa Tavern. Uh, so that means I probably have seen this guy play guitar too. You probably have. Um, I know at the very least you've uh, seen, because uh, I know um, another actor that uh, that I uh, use, Doug Esper, he was also in uh, uh, Chuck's band. In fact, Chuck was supposed to make an appearance in uh, Krista. Originally, the scene um, when we're in the haunted house was supposed to take place at a concert. And Chuck had said, "Hey, you know, we're going to be playing at the uh, the Rainbow. If you want, you can plug into our uh, uh, do our soundboard. You can film there. We have no problem with that." And unfortunately, my director of photography wasn't available that day. And Chuck's like, "No big deal. We'll be playing again." And then he unfortunately passed. Mm. Yeah, it was tragic. Mm. Just an amazing, um, guy. literally one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Is to just so so incredibly uh, nice. It's always awesome to come across people like that that you know turn out to be really nice people. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm looking at the uh, IMDb page for your next movie, Trivial. Uh, I really like the artwork, uh, can you, but there's no synopsis or anything about it. Can you tell us a little bit about this film? Absolutely. Uh, Trivial is um, about five strangers who have been uh, basically kidnapped and forced to partake in a uh, in a game, uh, in a game show, with a psychotic host that, if you uh, uh, that asks a series of trivia questions, uh, 
if you get them right, you uh, move to the next level. If you get them wrong, it, it's not good. <laughs> but Sasha Graham is the lead. She's absolutely amazing in this. And it's got uh, Drew, For uh, Drew Fortier, uh, Doug Asper, um, Adam Clevenger, Rick Germain, uh, Tim Novotny, and... Uh, uh, there's a there's a couple more surprises in there that I don't want to I don't want to let go just yet. <laughs> Fair enough. Have Fair in, enough. Uh, have you locked in that that is it is it done filming now? It's done filming. We are in post production hell with Trivial, and what ended up happening was we shot in 6K, which is absolutely stunning. The problem is it's very difficult to work with. What I, I learned the hard way on. And a lot of the editors that I have just weren't able to process it properly. So we finally, we do have a rough cut of it done at this point. And we're actually debating on trying something new. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to spill this on your show. Actually, uh, we're, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're considering doing something kind of new with this because it came in. So I, I, I make surprisingly long films. I'm aware of this, but this one is excessively long. So I'm considering doing, rather than releasing it as a movie, releasing it as a limited miniseries on both Amazon as well as Tubi. Um, now, if you get the Blu-ray or DVD, you get the entire series. But, uh, but uh, I think on Tubi and uh, Amazon, it will probably be separated by sections. Very cool. Very, yeah, mm -hmm. I, like, I like the sound of that. Uh, mm -hmm. It's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, when you do get it out, uh, will you do like any sort of festival circuit or anything like that, you think? or I'll be honest with you, and this is probably the wrong mentality, and I've always been like this. I don't care for festivals. I, I just don't. And the reason I don't is been, it's, been in, it's been my experience that most of them, it's a... Uh, it's, it's basically a bunch of people that are going to nominate their friends anyway. And... Uh, like I said, I don't really, uh, my own personal opinion, we tried it with Krista and it left a really bad taste in my mouth, especially considering like the problem with Krista and festivals was that um, a lot of these places want a very sharp 90 minute movie and that's not what Krista was. And I had festival runners saying, look, we love your movie, but how do you feel about chopping it down by a half an hour so we can screen it? I'm like, absolutely not. That's not going to happen. So if I don't get it in any festivals, I can personally live with that. Um, I know that's the wrong attitude to take. I know a lot of times, but I'll be honest with you. I mean, the only it used to be the only reason to go to festivals was to get distribution or to get other work. Well, nobody's getting any work from festivals. And the dis I, I self dis uh, distribute, and I'm very happy with self distributing. So I don't really need festivals, is what it comes down to. <laughs> well, with streaming services like Tubi, as we mentioned before, and all that around, you know, like it kind of cuts all that out to where oh, yeah. you can. I mean, one of the things, uh, like Germ had mentioned earlier, you know, we we are junkies for low budget. We are. We are like that's why I tell my friends like when you walk through or we used to walk through the video store and you're like who would watch that I'm the guy that watches oh yeah that. absolutely you know? um like every time like I I I'll give a lot of things that most people won't a chance and and that's what's wonderful about Tubi is it seems like they're willing to to give a lot of those type of movies you know uh, uh shelf space in their library oh, yeah. that's where you're not just like coming across like yeah okay I can watch Casino again or you know I can watch you know mission impossible 14 it's like you know <laughs> or i could watch this this movie i've never heard before and like give it a shot and find out something you know new i might not have um uh come across before right. you know, or if it was a video store I've rented because it's easier to not have to like put money down on a rental and be like oh you know and to where this you can be like all right give it 15 minutes the done catch right. me. It on to the next one you know mm. <laughs> and the nice thing about, I'll be honest with you, the nice thing about Tubi, too, is the fact that it's actually, unlike a lot of the streaming services, you can actually make your budget back just with Tubi. I mean, we were very fortunate, specifically with Krista, to where we made our budget back with just physical media. 
Tubi was icing on the cake, which was which was beautiful. And I actually, believe it or not, fought uh, going to Tubi tooth and nail because my line of thinking was, it's free, it's got commercial, who's going to watch it there? And how am I going to make any money? And then I got my first check with t- from Tubi, and I'm like, why didn't I do this before? This is amazing. So, yeah, I mean, cool. uh, it, from what I've heard is that also they have people that understand the type of films like that, that kind of curate it as well, like that that actually take the time to give a shit about these kinds of movies getting in there. And I I believe it shows, you know, I mean, like they have it from every different budget level in there and it seems like they don't really play a lot of favorites. Like my algorithm is so fucked on Tubi. Like people come. Oh yes. Whoa. (laughs) And like I said, I mean, I was 150% wrong. I, I honestly figured, okay, Tubi's where Chris is going to go to die. And he gave it a completely new audience, which I was thrilled about. I, I, I couldn't be happier with Tubi. Well, let's uh, uh, let's talk about uh, your most recent release. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. I didn't mean to cut you off. What'd you get? No, that's fine. I was just going to mention, like, I brought up the festival circuit only because uh, I I uh, learned about J.R. Bookwalter through the Chicago Rama Horror Horror Rama Film Festival, um, where they had booked him as a guest and they showed Robot Ninja. And then I became a big fan. You know, I watched Robot Ninja and Dead Next Door and, uh, you know, became friends with him on the, all the social medias. That's why I was like, well, maybe if they, they did another Chicago Horrorama Film Festival or a film festival in Chicago where they had genre uh, filmmakers in, it would be cool to have you over and I, uh, is show. That a- like that uh, where i consider it more like a convention appearance kind of thing yeah. i'm 100 for what i uh what i've always had a problem with was like i said it's like okay we're gonna pit uh we're gonna pit 150 different indie films against each other it's like no nah, i don't want any part of that so. <laughs> absolutely not i totally see that you know uh th- this film festival it was like three days but it was all indie films uh, with a couple like older like genre films that people hadn't seen in a while or hadn't heard of before and mm-hmm. had directors in to talk about them so yeah if, uh, it would be great if you did something like that um how far are you from yeah, chicago like that I'm thrilled i mean uh what was it in august i know i'm uh a guest at um what was it they have like an indie uh um an indie show in pittsburgh called uh gross fest that I'm going to be a guest for, and I'm like I said, I'm extremely because I don't get me wrong. I love meeting fans. I, I love meeting fans, and I love meeting fellow filmmakers. So that's a that's a good opportunity for me. I just I I think because of the the Chris uh, the the aftermath of Krista, it's like I, I've I've gotten this prejudice towards uh, film festival uh, runners and uh, distributors. So it's and I know I'm probably in the wrong for that. I would have loved to see how some of those theater runs were uh, towards the end of that with that with an audience that uh, the, the reaction that would have been very interesting to see. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I know what was it I, as a joke. I did submit Krista to the International Love and Romance Festival, <laughs> and they very politely declined. They did not want the film in their roster. <laughs> They're like, yo, three fourths of this, we were on board. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For some reason the ending always gets them. I don't know why. Yeah, I don't I don't know why that would bother anyone. <laughs> so you made an anthology film called Brimstone Incorporated. Uh you want to talk about that a little bit before we get out of here? That was one of those where um I after being so emotionally invested in Krista, I wanted just a dumb fun horror film. That's all I wanted to do. And for the most part for the most part, I'm happy with it. Uh, I mean, uh, in general, the movie itself, I'm happy with. Um, the audience wasn't there. <laughs> Nobody gave a shit about this movie. <laughs> so it was one of those where, okay, lesson learned. I'll do. <laughs> but um, but no, I mean, for me personally, I grew up with like Tales from the Crypt and Creep Show and all that. So I love horror anthologies. So I figured, okay, this would. Uh, uh, the complaint about Krista that I kept hearing was, well, you know, the horror aspect doesn't really happen until the last half. And it's like, okay, well, then I'll give you something that is completely horror. And what I learned was, and nobody cares about anthologies. So <laughs> I still think it's a good movie, but what, what the hell do I know? Soon. Each, uh, each story did have a very, um, where when, old tales from crypt had to have that like interesting little twist 
Uh, mm -hmm. You know, each story definitely incorporated that, which I thought was fun. Um, yeah. Especially the twist in the second story. Um, I really enjoyed that one uh, a, a lot uh, with the mother and the, the son bringing the date over. Uh, that was because that's that one. Literally, I had written that as a favor for somebody. Uh, 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 Jonathan Moody, who's another writer, uh, years ago had contacted me and said, hey, do you want to co-write a short story with me? I'm like, yeah, sure. And he, he sent me the he sent me an email and he already had half the script on. And I'm like, well, normally when I co-write with somebody, we start from the beginning and we co-write. He's like, no, no, no. I want you to, I've done half of it. You do the other half. I'm like, okay. So I read the script. I'm like, okay, what am I going to do with this? And I just completely had to do the twist ending. And it threw him through a loop because he's like, I wasn't expecting you to do that, but that's cool. And I'm like, oh God. So it sat on a shelf for years. And then when we decided to do Brimstone, I'm like, well, I don't have a whole lot of short scripts. Um, so I started going through my head what I had written, and I contacted him. And I'm like, hey, are you ever going to make this? And he's like, probably not. And I'm like, do you mind if I do? He's like, no, no, no that's great. Um, one question, can I still have a co-writer credit? And I'm like, well, yeah, you co-wrote it. Of course you can. So, so no, but it was a lot of fun. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you can uh, check out all his movies, including uh, most of the ones he starred in on Tubi. So, uh Go, uh, go, uh, hit, hit up his letterbox, check out what you want to see, and then look it up on Tubi because it's all there. Well, thank you again so much, guys. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, when, final you, words? Uh, when, you get, <laughs> when you get finished up with trivial, let us know and we'll, uh, we'll make sure to cover it over here. Absolutely. Trivia, uh, trivial is something I'm really excited about. And also, uh, J.R. Bookwalter's, uh, side effects may vary. It's his new, it's his first film since, uh, 2000. Uh, it's his first film in 23 years. 2001's um, Mega Scorpions. We covered right. it. On the show. But we're not going to mention that. Don't don't mention Mega Scorpions. But uh, <laughs> but um, uh, what was it? Uh, I, I I'm in it. Tina Krause is in it. Uh, Drew Fortier is in it. Uh, uh, Floyd Ewing Jr. from Dead Next Door. It's a lot of fun. Check it out. Absolutely. Well, uh, uh, once again, thanks for uh, coming uh, coming aboard the terror train here at Real Vile, Mr. James Edwards. It was a lot of fun talking to you, and I know that I'm a big fan now, and uh, I can't recommend her name was Krista enough to all the people out there in Real Vile land. Any last words for the people out there? Uh, just just please, dear God, keep, uh, keep watching my movies. I, I got a mortgage to pay. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I feel like I'm going to have to order a physical copy of that because it needs to be in my collection. Uh, they're, avail how they're available on uh, at makeflix.com if you're interested. There we go. Makeflix.com. Pick up your own copies of Her Name Was Krista and all the other fabulous films of James Edwards and J.R. Bookwalter. Uh, any final words for the people out there, Mr. Uh, Chris? Uh, keep an eye out for uh, all the announcements we're doing for King of the Kill that's coming up uh, on our socials. Uh, that's coming up August 12th. Uh, aside from that, um, keep watching dog shit. It's all we love. And of course, as always, this is your main ripper behind the motherfucking trigger, Mr. Germ T. Ripper saying keep it creepy, keep it spooky, keep it real vile forever. God bless America and send nudes. <laughs>